Hello, and welcome to the ACEs Aware question and answer session on the fundamentals of ACE screening and response in pediatrics. My name is Tanya Schwartz, and I'm with Arrera Health Group, and we're proud to be supporting the ACEs Aware initiative. We received so many questions on our June webinar that our presenters graciously offered to do a separate session to respond to your questions. And we also plan to do additional question and answer sessions in the future. So a big thank you to Simone Ippoliti, Dr. Gutierrez Wang, and Dr. Eva Ile for joining us today. And so I'd like to start by asking each of our presenters to introduce yourself, starting with Simone. Hi, so my name is Simone Ippoliti, and I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner and the site director at Baby Child Health Center in San Francisco. Hi, good morning. I'm Lisa Gutierrez Wang. I am the Director of Children's Behavioral Health for Santa Cruz County. I'm a clinical psychologist and happy to be here. I'm Eva Ely. I'm a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist, and I am on clinical faculty at UCSF. Great. Well, thank you all. And let's jump right in because we have a lot of questions to cover today. Um, so we received a series of fundamental questions from providers who are just learning about ACE screening and want to understand the general approach that you all take in your practice. Um, so Simone, let's start with you. Um, the first question is, um, do you do routine ACE screening or do you selectively pick who to screen? And at what age do you start screening and who fills out the screening tool? Is it the child and or the parent? And how does that vary depending on the patient's age? Thank you, Tanya. Yes, so we start all routine uh, screening at age one and we do it at every well child check. That being said, with the there is this added caveat that if we have any concern for ACEs prior to the first birthday, we will administer an ACE screen for the parent um, prior to that. At age one through age 12, it's typically the parent who fills the ACE screener out. And then starting at age 13, both the parent and the teen would fill out their, their own ACE screen. Um, do you use the identified or the de-identified screening tool? And why do you use the one you've chosen and, and what has been your experience with it? We use the de-identified at the clinic, um, mostly because I think it's much more accessible for families, especially on first pass of using the ACE screen with the intention that we ultimately um, connect this family with a behaviorist who is trained in ACEs and trauma-informed care, and that behaviorist would likely do the identified screen. So that's correct. Um, as soon as a warm handoff comes to me as a behavioral health provider, I'm obviously establishing a relationship with the family and really going through a more comprehensive intake process. And through that process, I would be doing an identified ACEs assessment. So no longer a screener because I would actually be getting that information from primary care, but really having a conversation about which um, adversities, which ACEs the child has gone through, and then also understanding the caregivers, um, ACEs and trauma history. So that would be part of a larger assessment process. I will say that, you know, in talking to other primary care settings, the decision to use the identified versus the de-identified version of the tools is really a big decision. So within the ACEs Aware framework, we're really interested in understanding dose and then symptomatology or related symptomatology to really then make determinations about care and potential referral for additional services. Um, so I will say that having that de-identified, the number, the dose, um, is really helpful helpful in that context. But there are some primary care settings that really do want the um, information about which types of adversity the child has been exposed to, and they do choose to use the identified version. Um, but that really is a process of looking at both options, understanding what resources you have available within your own clinic. Do you have integrated behavioral health who's available to step in to provide that additional support during the appointment? Um, do you have clear referral sources? Are those referral sources 
smooth so there isn't a large gap between the time that the child is screened and then that connection to the um, appropriate additional services. Um, so I will say that there are some primary care providers who are really comfortable using the identified version. Um, I will say that in my experience, those are folks who do have quite a bit of experience and feel like they're already having those types of conversations with their families and have established that relationship um, and really know how to navigate the process of providing appropriate containment um, within the appointment itself um, if additional, you know, uh, if there's additional need to actually further process and explore. So we received some questions about how do you conduct a screenings for specific populations of children? So we've had questions about children who are differently abled, children involved in foster care, um, children with disabilities. Can you talk a little bit about how you um, work with those with different populations? Yes. So I find that doing an ACE screen with a foster parent, especially if they um, recently became the foster parent for this child, is actually can, can be very therapeutic for both the, the child and the caregiver. A lot of times this caregiver may not have access to all the information, all the medical information or, or background of this child previous to their um, coming into that parent's care. And so what we typically do is go through, like do a medical record review, go through the records and actually use the ACE screen as a vehicle to have these conversations about what this child's background is and what are some potential um, adverse childhood experiences that they may have experienced prior to being with this parent. And then we typically make the ACE score a convergence of both what the foster parent knows about this child and also what we've shared over the course of this, um, what we've learned over the course of the medical record review. What do you do if someone does not want to fill out the ACE screen and or discuss the results? How do you handle those situations? If a parent doesn't want to fill out the ACE screen, I typically the first thing I typically do is assess what are some potential barriers to filling out that ACE screen. Is it because they're fatigued from multiple questionnaires that they had to fill out? Is it because they don't understand why we're asking these really personal questions? Or is it because they just don't feel comfortable sharing this information with us just yet? Depending on what the particular barrier is, I always try to provide some context of why we're asking what is considered such personal questions and why it is so important for maybe not the reason for visit today, but the reason for visit six months from now, a year from now, and really try to format that A screen as a vital sign and, and really putting it from the standpoint of, I need this information the way I would need access to, you know, your child's blood pressure or their heart rate. Um, if the parent after this conversation still feels uncomfortable sharing or, or filling out this questionnaire, I, I typically just kind of hold in that moment and maybe read and start the next visit, making sure that we're really following their lead on what they feel comfortable sharing and what they don't, just as we would with any other questionnaire. Yeah, the piece that I can add is just, you know, really wanting to prepare all the staff within the clinic to be able to answer questions that might come up when this instrument is introduced to a caregiver or an adolescent who's doing a self-report. Um, so if this is being introduced by a medical assistant or some other uh, staff within the clinic, just really recognizing um, that they can come back and say, you know, this is a standard screening process. We feel it's so important because we understand that exposure to adversity and trauma can cause you know, stress that has a long impact on health, both physical and mental health. So giving the folks um, within the clinic various language to be able to address questions and concerns, um, and then also always say, you know, you can talk about this further with your primary care provider to really leave it open that this is part of a larger conversation and that this is a larger part of providing good medical care to the family. Um, so definitely wanting to get everyone in the clinic kind of comfortable with the fact that folks might have questions or might be cautious um, or might choose not to complete the form and that that's okay. So really I'm um, wanting to provide those tools um, before screening actually starts. So Simone and Dr. Gutierrez-Wing, um, what do you do when there are discrepancies in the screening results, either because someone's score changes significantly from one visit to the next visit 
or if there are differences between the adolescent and parental responses to the screening tool? You know, how do you um, how do you handle those situations? So if the a score changes over time, I typically will address that if it's the same reporter. So if the child changes their A score from from one well child check to, to the next, in this case, you know, it would be a teenager, or if the same caregiver is changing their A score over over one year to the next. Um, one I want to assess for has there been a new ACE since the last time I saw you? Or is this more a facet of maybe feeling more um, more trusting in the relationship and therefore able to disclose more of what has happened maybe years ago. Um, but I always try to to gauge kind of where that, that shift is. If it's between reporters, so if the parent has a lower A score than the child, I won't necessarily disclose the teen's A score to the parent. Um, and I really try to treat that A score as part of the confidential uh, confidential screeners that that child would otherwise fill out, like the PHQ-9. If the, and especially because I think teens typically um, ultimately end up identifying the de-identified screener and going through it and just saying like, yes, no, across the board, even though it, it is a total number. Um, and so especially for that reason, we really want to kind of keep that information confidential. Now had that conversation with the teen in the confidential portion of the visit of trying to get a sense of why their score might be different than their caregiver's report. So I'll just add, within the ACE is Aware framework, my understanding is that for providers when they're recording and then billing, they would use the higher number um, if there are two screens that are administered, so one to the caregiver and one to the youth themselves. Um, so I will just put that in. With respect to our experience, um, and then also experience from other uh, primary care settings that have shared uh, when they're doing both parent and youth screening, um, there is a tendency for youth to actually report a higher score than their caregiver. So this might be that they are just more willing to share more information, um, or they might just know more about their own experiences. And so that might be reflected in the difference in scores. Um, I will just mention, so that might just be a trend that you will see in your clinic if you begin screening. Um, but the other piece is that often they aren't within the same range. Um, so, of course, in the scoring algorithm for the PEARLS tool, um, you have, you know, very low risk, which would be a score of zero, and then their response might be the same, psychoeducation or anticipatory guidance for the family. Um, and then you really have that score of one to three, and then you're really trying to determine if there are additional symptoms that would be indicative of a toxic stress response. Um, and so if a caregiver and a youth have, you know, that or they're in that intermediate or moderately, um, you know, moderate risk, um, you're really thinking about the symptomatology and then that is framing your intervention. And then of course, if there is a score of four and above, even let's say if the caregiver is reporting five and the youth is reporting you know, seven, um, you're still gonna be in that high risk area um, or range. And so your response um, may be pretty consistent across. So just to kind of note that even if you do have a difference in the scores, your response because of the way that we score might actually be consistent. Um, but to anticipate that you will have um, changes from year to year. Um, you know, obviously, if the score is increasing from year to year, um, that might mean that there really is additional exposure that's happening. So really talking to the family once again um, about the importance of having these conversations in primary care, that they can come in and seek additional services and support um, if the family continues to experience additional adversities and traumas. Um, if we do see these changes from a higher score going down to a lower score, then it really is, you know, part of that conversation of understanding you know, what's going on with the family now? Is this a new provider, perhaps? Um, is that level of trust maybe not yet established? So I think these are all things just to anticipate, but once again, understanding that our scoring algorithm gives us some flexibility. And that once again, this is all about uh, the relationship and having that additional conversation within your well child visit and understanding what additional symptoms um, you are seeing and how those fit within the context um, of ACEs and toxic stress. And then our last question for this section is um, Simone and Dr. Gutierrez Wang. How do you work to ensure that the A screening itself, the conversations about the screening results, and the clinical response avoid re traumatizing patients? 
What we typically do is make sure that we're using the de-identified screen so that the family doesn't feel like they're disclosing a, a new trauma for the first time. Um, maybe they haven't you know, had this conversation in other settings. Unless the parent chooses to disclose, and sometimes that does happen. Sometimes the parent, this is really kind of the start of a conversation where the parent feels comfortable sharing uh, the, the different ACEs that this child has experienced previous to this visit. As, as we said before, we try to have that identified portion happen with the behavior so that there is a really kind of dedicated and safe space to process um, any kind of, of re-traumatization that may be occurring in the moment so that we're not sending that family out the door without some, some real work being done around that ACE screen. If I find that I, I, or if I find that I have sufficient time and bandwidth in the visit, I typically try to have that, that larger conversation around that ACE score and what that, how that ACE score kind of is associated with some of the things we're seeing in that child in this visit. If I don't feel like I have the time to truly kind of give this conversation um, the the space it deserves, then I schedule a follow up visit. So that and it, that follow up visit is just about really processing that A screen. And I typically kind of treat this as a case by case basis, depending on what the needs of that family are in the moment and what is my capacity to really give them the space they deserve. So I'll just add that, you know, so much um, of this is pre-work in the clinic um, and really setting up a framework for how you will introduce a screening. Um, and a part of that is also really walking through how do you provide the appropriate containment um, at each kind of interaction. So what does that look like if it's your medical assistant introducing the screening tool, right? So giving the medical assistant's tools and language around how to introduce it, how to normalize it, how to address really expected questions like, why are you giving me this screening or do I have to complete it? Um, so that everything feels contained and it can then be, you know, if someone does have a question, you know, your primary care provider can follow up with you with additional information. So giving everyone kind of the sense of what piece they're holding um, and how to support the family and child within each of those interactions. So when you go into the actual appointment, really understanding, are you doing the screening within the context of a well child visit? How much time do you have as a primary care provider? Um, and going in and actually providing within that context before you start your appointment, right? So I'm so happy to see you today. We have about, give the number of minutes uh, together today, and we're going to be going through this, really. So providing the family with an understanding of what to expect, um, I think also really helps provide that containment and that expectation of how deep you'll be going in uh, to this particular piece of the appointment. Um, so I I think providing all of those um, context and that priming for the family is really beneficial so that when you do get to the review of the a screener, you're putting it within context. And once again, that de-identified screen provides you with a language around dose um, and then that ability to really talk about dose and adopt another, you know, other symptoms and really put it in the context of the medical visit. Um, you know, if an individual then does begin to disclose, I think providing some training to the family around how to say, you know, today we really want to understand this because we know that stress can increase the likelihood of these additional physical health or mental health, you know, challenges, conditions, etc. Um, you know, if we want to go ahead and explore this further, we would love to do that and then provide some options for when and how that happens. So Simone mentioned, you know, scheduling a follow-up appointment. So the family then knows, okay, this is going to be the time and the place where we're going to have the space to explore this further. Um, if you are in a setting where you do have integrated behavioral health um, and you do have someone that can be brought in even during that session to go ahead and meet with that family for a longer period of time and really process and hold that, um, obviously that can be an option. So it's really a lot of prep work and understanding what your flow and what your resources are within your clinical setting that I think can really dictate and prepare you uh, to provide that appropriate containment and support to the youth and families. Um, so switching gears, um, we have received a lot of questions from providers and practices that are interested in starting to conduct A screenings and provide trauma-informed care. And so they're looking for advice on which staff in their clinical practice should be trained, 
how do you train them? How do you kind of create a culture um, among all of the staff um, around e-screenings and, and trauma-informed care? Um, so I'll ask each of you to, to talk about that. Um, Simone, do you want to kick us off? And then we'll go to Dr. Gutierrez Wang and Dr. Ely. For any, any uh, site or clinic that is planning on starting the process of screening for ACEs, I definitely recommend taking a look at the ACEs Aware core training and really using that as your, your guide for how to go through the process of training both your front desk staff, your, your MA, your providers. I will say making sure that every member of the care team is trained in, in knowing what ACEs are and knowing what trauma-informed care means um, and knowing what their role in that, in that workflow and in that process and empowering them to really be a part of each, each family's care team is going to be really important to, make, to the success of being able to um, screen for ACEs at your practice. Yeah, that was beautifully said. Um, I definitely concur that everyone in your clinical setting should be trained. Um, there might be different tiers of training. Um, so everyone should get information around trauma-informed care. What does that mean? Um, they should get information about, you know, what are ACEs? What is trauma? What is kind of a broader um, understanding of childhood adversity? How do you differentiate between these terms so that we have common language so that when we're talking about this, um, there's that clarity? Um, so everyone should get that level of introductory training. Um, and then really looking at your workflow. So who is going to be introducing a screening tool? Every single step. And then really understanding what does that particular role um, require to be able to make this work, uh, to provide that content, to provide enough information so that the family feels you know, able to participate in the screening process and then all the way through a referral process. Um, so general training for everyone and then kind of tiered looking at workflow to understand what additional training and support your staff need. Obviously initial training, but really thinking about training ongoing. So something out, coming back, understanding working, what is not. So really a process um, more than kind of one-time training type of um, scenario. I will just mention that, of course, ACE is aware is going to be a huge resource for your training needs. Um, but also, you know, looking at SAMHSA, they have amazing trauma-informed care uh, resources. The Center for Healthcare Strategies is also another one that I would recommend. Um, and then here in California, we've got Trauma Transformed, which is the East Bay Agency for Children um, that does some amazing um, training and support to organizations who are really embarking upon uh, provision of trauma-informed care. So there are definitely resources out there, both free and then, of course, um, resources that you can contract out for. And I'll follow up on um, the information that my colleagues have presented in saying that um, both uh, have talked about the, the system within which we are doing these screenings. And it's really important to recognize that we, we keep referring to uh, trauma-informed systems, um, I think, which is really key um, because in order for providers to work with um, our, our clients, our patients um, who have been exposed to ACEs, um, we, uh, we do this best when we recognize that, um, that adverse experiences affect us all um, and um, everyone within the, the system of care um, ha can recognize that, that we've all um, been exposed to um, adverse experiences at some point in our lives. Um, and recognize the fact that when we are talking about um, adverse experiences and, and trauma with the people that we work with, um, that can be potentially triggering um, for those of us who are actually doing that work. And so recognizing um, that there is a secondary traumatic stress, um, what's other, otherwise referred to as re-traumatization, um, and recognizing that, um, that we as staff um, also can um, support one another in, um, in recognizing and, uh, and mitigating the effects of re-traumatization. 
and we can go into to some of those details um, a bit later, but just to recognize that working within a, a trauma-informed system of care um, also means recognizing that um, those individuals providing that care um, also can experience trauma and re-traumatization. Thank you. And I just want to reiterate what Simone and Dr. Gutierrez Wang mentioned about the ACEs Aware core training. Um, it is designed for primary care providers, but it's open to all providers and anyone who is interested in it. Um, and ACEs Aware is also funding organizations to develop supplemental trainings to train specific types of providers and staff on a myriad of topics related to ACE screening and clinical response. So more information will be coming about those. Um, Dr. Eli, you started to talk about um, mitigating and preventing the re-traumatization of staff. And so can you and Dr. Gutierrez-Wing talk a little bit about how you address potential re-traumatization of staff that may arise um, and kind of what are your, what are your activi activities around that to try to prevent and mitigate that? Sure. Um, so again, the, the idea is that we recognize that um, when we are talking about other people's traumas, um, that we ourselves um, can be reminded of traumas that we've experienced um, in our past or even the, the traumatic experiences that we're currently dealing with. And um, to recognize that this can be um, quite a challenge that is, um, you know, an additional uh, stressor that we're experiencing in, in our workday. And that um, it's important to be prepared to uh, address these additional stressors, you know, stressors beyond our day-to-day our -day, uh, work life. Um, and so, again, working within a trauma-informed system of care, uh, it we would um, encourage um, the, the office um, leadership or the, the clinic leadership um, to in part um, prepare staff um, to recognize that uh, re-traumatization re and secondary traumatic stress uh, are real, um, that um, that there can be um, information sessions held uh, prior to the rollout of um, ACEs screening, for example, um, to help those um, staffers who will be doing the screening recognize that um, they can have um, re-triggering or, or triggering experiences and prepare them for that. Um, and then, um, perhaps do simulations of what it might be like to, um, to do these screenings with patients, again, in, in, um, in preparation of uh, working uh, with these patients uh, or clients. Um, and then in response, so after the, the preparation phase um, and simulation phases, then having an opportunity to um, address any potential experiences of re-traumatization, um, perhaps by providing a safe space for staff to, to take a break in um, after they've had a, a challenging uh, re-traumatizing experience, um, as well as having the opportunity to, um, to talk uh, with, um, with leadership about their experiences and how to potentially mitigate um, future experiences. So there are a range of, um, of supporting uh, processes that um, a trauma-informed system of care can implement to um, mitigate the potential for re-traumatization when, um, when ACEs screenings are performed. Yes, I will just add that, you know, in going into this work and preparing your clinic, I think it's so important to have this stance um, that exposure to adversity, trauma, 
is normal with respect to this is a shared experience. So to really normalize it um, and make that connection to stress um, as we're educating about toxic stress physiology, but more generally that we are all navigating adversity and we all have stress uh, to really understand that there can be positive stress, but when it becomes overwhelming when we don't have that support or that buffering, um, then it can really be, you know, become overwhelming and that there are additional uh, supports that can be put in place and that there are tools and supports that are available to our children, our families and ourselves. So a first piece is to normalize it. Um, and then I think what's really nice about the ACEs Aware Framework is these six domains of wellness that we talk about, which is restorative sleep, restorative adequate sleep, um, you know, nutrition, regular physical activity, mindfulness, supportive relationships. And I am forgetting one at the moment, which is horrible. Let's see. Um, so we talked about sleep, nutrition, physical activity, mindfulness, supportive relationships. What am I missing, guys? Mental health supports. <laughs> a behavioral health provider forgot mental health support. Um, well, there you go. So these six core domains, um, you know, but these are things that are available to all of us. Um, so really, once again, normalizing um, our response to adversity and that we're all going to have stress and that we have these available to us so that we can really focus on our sleep or how we're eating or how we're moving. Um, and hopefully for most of our providers, um, you know, and all of our clinic staff, they do have access to either an employee assistance program or to a direct supervisor, someone that they can talk to, to debrief with, and then get connected to additional supports if they do need that. So normalization and then really in their quickly introducing that we have tools and resources, some that, you know, are really just accessible to all of us, others that we might need to, you know, navigate and get a referral for. Um, so that I think is really the foundation and the basis. Um, and then as you roll out screening, really understanding how do we create space so that our staff can have connection to supportive relationships within the clinic. So is that their supervisor? Is that their peers? Um, within um, our clinic setting, you know, we had identified a partner or a pair. Um, so if you needed someone to check in with or be brief with, that's not your supervisor. That might be more available. Um, you know, who is that person potentially that you can go to? We developed some language around if you do need to check in with someone, if you do need just that five minutes to debrief and kind of share what just happened, and, um, and have someone to be able to hold that and mindfully listen, not necessarily need to resolve, but just a place and a person um, that you can go to just to put that down <laughs> and then be able to move on to the next part of your work. So really thinking about within your clinic what's available already, what you can build up, whether that is an idea of having a partner, regular supervision, regular huddles where you incorporate some of these conversations um, into it. Um, how do you facilitate, you know, really encouraging people to take their breaks, um, to be able to eat healthily, to be able to maybe eat together so those social relationships can be fostered? Um, is it possible when you do take a lunch break to take a walk together? So how do you incorporate, you know, healthy eating, physical movement into your day? Um, if you do have regular team meetings or before your huddle, can you take one minute and do a mindfulness activity together? So really thinking about ways that you can incorporate and live um, these values within the clinic setting itself, um, I think can be really helpful. So we've received um, a lot of questions asking for you to share the language that you use with patients and families. We've mentioned it a little bit today, but how do you introduce the link between ACEs and toxic stress and symptoms they might have and the clinical interventions that you're recommending? Can you give us the actual language um, that providers can, can use with their patients? And we can start with Simone and go to Dr. Gutierrez-Wang and then Dr. Yue. Absolutely. I would say that the language typically becomes, especially as you get more comfortable with it, typically becomes situation dependent. Um, and so I'm not necessarily using the same um, like cookie cutter spiel each time. I, I try to nuance it to um, A, the degree of awareness that this family has around ACEs. And so this is the first time we've talked about ACEs. I'm going to talk about it very differently than if this is, you know, the third or fourth well child check that this family has had with our practice and, and they know about ACEs. We've had this conversation before. For the purposes of this discussion, I'll probably um, 
just talk about how I would introduce it if this was the first time that we were giving this ACE screen out to this family. So usually I say, I, I recognize some of the questions on this ACE screener may feel um, intimate or personal, and I want to make sure that anytime I give you a questionnaire, I'm explaining to you why why we're asking these questions, whether it's your ACE screener or um, the depression scale for the teenager. And I say, we ask these questions because we understand that uh, stressors early in life can contribute to the, the health of your child, both in their early life and going forward into adulthood. And then having some understanding of how many stressors your child has experienced that are on this list provided really help us understand how we can support you and your family and how we can support you in supporting yourselves to be able to uh, buffer against some of the effects of these stressors on your child's health. All right. So for me, I can talk a little bit about maybe what I might say if I'm being introduced to a family uh, during their um, medical appointment. So within an integrated behavioral health setting um, where a primary care uh, provider has already reviewed the results and then is asking the family if they'd like to be introduced to a, prime, uh, a behavioral health provider and I'm coming in um, and being introduced. So usually what might happen is that the PCP will do a brief introduction when I come into the room. Um, but may at one point then be transitioning out to their next appointment. Um, so what I would be um, saying to the family is, of course, that I'm you know, so happy to, to meet them, um, that I work within a larger team here in the clinic. Uh, so I partner with their primary care provider to support children, youth, and families, um, and that I understand that they've completed an ACE screener and that I'm coming in to see if I can be of additional support. And once again, reiterating, you know, we understand that children and families go through stressful life events and that stress can have an impact on both their physical and mental health um, across the lifespan. And so I'm here to see if I can provide some support to your child, um, specific tools to help navigate stress. Um, stress. Um, and then for the parent and caregiver, really saying, you know, you are the most important person in your child's life. You're going to be there with them throughout the day, throughout their life. And so I'm here to provide you with support and tools, um, with information, with knowledge, uh, so that you can be the most effective in your parenting, because we know that that is so important to you. So I think the big takeaways are just kind of building upon what the PCP has already done to introduce me. Um, and then once again, normalizing the idea of we all are navigating stress and that I as a behavioral health can provider can provide specific support to the child around coping skills and coping resources. And that I am also wanting to partner with the caregiver uh, to be of support to them because ultimately they are gonna have the impact on their child. Um, so that's a little bit of how I would um, engage them during that warm handoff process. And when I'm working with um, the patients, it's usually after um, both the, the primary care provider has had a chance to, to talk with them about ACEs and, and the screening process, and after the behavioral health clinician has also had an opportunity um, to work with them uh, related to to their stress and, and how um, non-pharmacologic approaches can be helpful. Um, by the time I'm involved in, in the care, um, I usually uh, can be very focused on um, the, the physiologic aspects of stress, and that's what I tend to do. Um, I frame my work as um, the, the brain doctor, who uh, has an interest and, and an understanding of how uh, the stress response, and I, I use that terminology, the stress response affects um, behavior and how behavior affects the rest of the body. And so um, I do talk about the, the physiology of the stress response. I do tend to um, refer to the stress response as uh, the fight or flight mechanism. A lot of people have heard about fight or flight. It's, it's a common phrase in common parlance. And so um, it, when, we, when we frame it as fight or flight, and, and I can talk about the physiology of, of fight or flight, what that means, what that looks like, and, and how that um, 
that physiology translates into human behavior, right? We're not just talking about a zebra escaping a lion. What we're talking about is um, how that, that impulse to flee um, for a child can mean um, anything from avoidance of things that are, are scary um, to, um, to literally running away from, um, from home or from school. So that's the flight piece. And then also um, framing the, the fight component of fight or flight as you know, aggressive outbursts or angry outbursts. And so um, focusing on the physiology of the stress response, focusing on um, how, how our brains function uh, during stress, the fact that um, our thinking brains can go offline when we're under stress. And all we're left with is um, those primitive instincts that we have, what, we, what I like to, to refer to as the lizard brain, how the lizard brain is active during those times of stress, um, and what, what that means to have our primitive brains um, in charge and um, how, how challenging that can be. So, so I focus on the stress response, the physiology, and what, um, what the stress response physiology uh, translates into in terms of behaviors. Um, and again, focusing on that idea of fight or flight, that, um, that's often a, a helpful way to, to talk about the stress response. Great, well, thank you all so much for taking the time today. We really appreciate it.